things are working. Brilliant. So I want to thank everyone for being here for our Science Cafe event this evening. Uh, most importantly, I want to encourage those of you who haven't got a beer and some food to uh, work with the wonderful sponsors here at the, the last round and grab yourself something to drink and eat. Uh, we do get this space gratis, so it's a wonderful contribution to our Science Cafe evening. Uh, so the Oh, thank you. So this evening's speaker is Dan Gillette, who is with Buzzard Bay Coalition, and he's going to speak to us this evening about Buzzard Bay Brook, a little bit of its history, and the plans for some restoration. So Dan, please. All right, guys. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks to the uh, wait and bar staff for serving up some good cold beer and food, and uh, I'll get right into it. Um, so. I'm the uh, project manager for the uh, Buttonwood Brook Restoration Action Plan, what we just call the Buttonwood to Bay Project for short. Um, and this project is an EPA funded five year project, which I think is an artificial boundary. With, I see it going well beyond five years to investigate and restore Buttonwood Brook and Aponagansett Bay to the greatest degree possible. Um, so, when I first started this project, one of the first things I did was just get out and find out what ground truth was. Um, get out and walk the entire brook. And I think most people don't realize that Buttonwood Brook is actually just under nine miles when you include the main channel and all of its tributaries. I think most people associate Buttonwood Brook with the park and maybe a little section outside the park. But this brook is actually part of a vast ecosystem, a circulatory system, if you will, for the entire watershed. Um, guys like Vic Maley, who's sitting at this table right here, spent a lot of time in the woods with me, <laughs> busting through pricker bushes and walking every inch of Buttonwood Brook and its tributaries so that we could look at what was really going on out there. Because I feel like Buttonwood Brook really is invisible outside of Buttonwood Park. Um, and there's all these amazing pocket forests that the brook flows through, and those pocket forests right now are not accessible to you or anybody else. They're, they're really difficult to access, they're really muddy, um, they're full of invasive species that make movement difficult, um, and, and you know, hopefully we change that in the long run. So once we got those walks done, um, we started sort of digging into a little bit of the history. You know, from my perspective, I look at the history of this place and I want to know what happened. You know, where did we go wrong with Buttonwood Brook? Um, with this sort of defining waterway uh, of New Bedford that runs down from Hathaway Road at its headwaters and is a defining feature in Buttonwood Park, uh, an Olmstead Design Park and then makes its way all the way down to Aponagansett Bay, which is just a beautiful bay. Um, the, the brook itself is an amazing natural resource for local communities that provides social, cultural, and ecological value. Where did we go wrong? Um, so I started looking back at history, and it was really difficult to find much written about Buttonwood Brook outside of Buttonwood Park and the Olmstead history that's linked to that and a few mills down in Cape Nairn, that, uh, like John Wadey Mill, right off of Elm Street. Um, outside of that, there wasn't much written about the brook. Um, and one of the ways that I found a window back into history was to look at maps. Um, the, the US Geological Survey actually has topographic maps that go back to 1888 for this whole area. Those are available online, they're all digitized, you can download them as PDFs. Um, and I started going back, starting in 1888, and moving forward map by map, and comparing how the landscape was changing over all of that time. Um, and I noticed that, you know, in the first 50 years, 60 years, up through the World War II era, there wasn't much change in this landscape. Um, but as I got into the post-war era, I noticed that there were rapid and drastic changes occurring in the landscape. 
And I found that really interesting, you know, the factors, the post-war post -war prosperity, the GI Bill that opened up housing to a lot of people, um, the widespread use of automobiles drove this urbanization and suburban sprawl that fundamentally changed the Buttonwood Brook watershed. Uh, and that's also reflected in the parcel maps. As you look around and you look at parcel data for New Bedford and Dartmouth, you'll see that most of the houses that are built in the floodplain or adjacent to the brook, taking up critical habitat, were built during that same time period, from 1950 to 1980. Um, and then in the post-1980 era, a lot of regulations started coming down. I mean, and truthfully, during the 50s and 60s, there wasn't a lot of scientific knowledge about the importance of wetlands. They were, in, in a lot of ways, wetlands were derided. The federal government was paying people to fill in wetlands to drive economic development. Um, all the way up through 1977 until Jimmy Carter signed some executive orders that banned the practice of filling in wetlands. So we just didn't know. This was an era when we were still spraying DDT. Um, you know, we were still using asbestos um, and, you know, an era of the, sort of this, the Rachel Carson Silent Spring, which was sort of an awakening for everybody as to what our actions were causing. So I would say, from my perspective, the majority of the damage to the Buttonwood Brook watershed, the brook and upon against at bay, occurred during that short 30-year period. Um, it's, it's, which is really interesting to me that how much of an impact that short period of rapid development had on this watershed. And when you look at eelgrass maps, which go all the way back to 1921, you can correlate the disappearance of eelgrass in the inner Aponagansett Bay with the latter part of that period where we just, and today there is no eelgrass in inner Aponagansett Bay. So, you know, we look at the impact of that watershed change that occurred. You know, as we see urbanization and we see rapid suburban sprawl, we fundamentally alter the character of the watershed. What was once a watershed with wide floodplains, great riparian buffer, five, six hundred yards wide on either side of the brook, was transformed into a watershed that is highly runoff dependent. So as we paved things, as our rooftops emerged in areas that were formerly forested, all of these impervious surfaces that do not allow water to penetrate started to aggregate. They scaled up. And to match that, we had infrastructure projects that built stormwater pipes and catch basins that could rapidly aggregate and handle that new volume of surface runoff. What used to be going into the ground to recharge groundwater and slowly flow and feed our brook from underneath was now running off rapidly, being collected by a really efficient system of pipes and catch basins and deposited directly into Buttonwood Brook, completely untreated. Um, believe it or not, there's 60 outfalls, stormwater outfalls, on Buttonwood Brook. 60. And every major street between Hathaway Road in the northern part of the watershed and Aponagansett Bay at its southern terminus drains into Aponagansett, into Buttonwood Brook completely untreated. So why do we care? <laughs> um, you know, Buttonwood Brook, like I said earlier, is this amazing natural resource that has value across um, multiple functions, social, cultural, environmental, provides tremendous ecosystem services to the communities it traverses. And it does traverse a very diverse group of communities, um, socioeconomic, ethnic, linguistic classes. This brook transitions across all of them, uh, provides vital climate resilience functions, even in its degraded state, it continues with one arm tied behind its back to buffer flooding, to mitigate heat island effects, to provide corridors up and down its watershed for 
wildlife, it supports aquatic and terrestrial biodiversity, and it supports human health. It provides green space for wildlife and people, and it buffers the stresses of daily life. Um, what we see today with eroded riparian habitat, eroded floodplains, and this highly efficient stormwater system is a positive feedback loop. Um, developed areas tend to have much more pollution than forested areas. Um, in forests, we have decomposing trees and shrubs and leaves and leaf litter on the floor, but that is generally being decomposed and infiltrated down into the soil where nutrients and bacteria are managed. Today, those nutrients and bacteria are flowing off our rooftops, flowing off our front lawns where we scatter fertilizer, flowing out of our backyards where our dogs poop, um, flowing off of streets and rapidly making their way into the brook. And because of that habitat degradation along the brook, those pollutants make their way into a pond against a bay very rapidly. Um, in the past, the brook, um, and I'll use Route 140 as an example. Between Route 140 and the Hidden Brook Apartments that are just north of it, off Bryant Lane, in the north end of New Bedford, right on the Dartmouth border, uh, there was over 600 acres of wetland essentially erased when the Hidden Brook Apartments were built and Route 140 was put in place. And that was replaced with a very straightened channel of Buttonwood Brook that now carries all those pollutants down into Buttonwood Pond and beyond. So our development paradigm during that 30 year period has created a reinforcing feedback loop that continues to feed off itself and carry those pollutants downstream. So what are we doing right now in the Buttonwood to Bay project? Phase one of this project is entirely science driven. We are essentially replicating the comprehensive study that was done by Brian Howes, the late Brian Howes, who just recently passed away, who I have to give credit for his linked embayment model, which was really a revolutionary model for studying aquatic ecosystems in southeast Massachusetts. It links together freshwater feeder streams, land use, pollutant loading, septic system use, together into a comprehensive model that allows you to determine how much pollution you have going into your waterway, and two, to get a total maximum daily load on that waterway, which I'll talk about later. So our program right now is sampling brook water at 17 locations up and down the brook. We're also placing sensors in the brook that have water quality parameters associated with them and tell us about water level. As we move down the brook, we're also measuring flow in the brook using an instrument that uses Doppler to measure flow across a channel and then calculates discharge. We are in the bay doing water quality measurements in the bay. Um, those are measuring chlorophyll levels, which are sort of indicative of the bay's eutrophication state or its enrichment state. So chlorophyll is sort of an indicator of algae growth. Um, and everyone, I don't know if everyone saw the article in the New York Times a few weeks ago, um, but the Cape is sort of in a algae crisis at this point because of similar nutrients that we're dealing with here, which is really for saltwater embayments, it's nitrogen. For freshwater streams, it's phosphorus. We're also dealing with bacteria and we're dealing with sediment loads. Um, so as we get into the bay, we're measuring water quality, we're me measuring chlorophyll, dissolved oxygen, salinity levels, conductivity levels, which are a measure of how much suspended solids there are in the water, um, and we are measuring uh, pH and temperature at all these locations as well. Um, and then layering on top of that, we, over the last summer, 
conducted a benthic habitat survey where we scooped mud out from the bottom of the Ponagansett Bay in 12 locations and looked at the macroinvertebrate community that is living inside of the sediments, which is an indicator of bay health. Um, and we also worked with the Marine Biological Lab in Woods Hole to do a benthic flux survey, which looks at the nutrients that are currently in the sediment and how they exit the sediment when temperatures rise. So most of the studies in the bay are occurring over the summer months because temperature has a huge effect on the water quality inside of Ponagansett Bay. Um, and, and I'll mention that the, the sensors we have out collecting water quality data in the Brookhaven Bay are recording data every 15 minutes autonomously for as long as they're left out there. So right now we have somewhere between 500,000 and 600,000 data points that we are looking at um, to correlate all this data. So how does all this scientific data connect? Um, number one, you know, it's, it's providing us a baseline of what the brooks and the bay's health are because we look at the Brook and Bay as an interconnected system in sort of the Danella Meadows notion of a system with inputs and outputs. Um, and what we want to understand with all of this science, all of this water quality, sampling in bottles, sending this stuff off to labs, is how does the system respond to rainfall um, as the key driver that carries pollution from all of this urbanized area and suburban sprawl into the brook and eventually down to the bay. So with our water level loggers in the bay and our water sampling in the bay, we can correlate those days when it rains and when it's dry, and we can compare that data downstream inside the bay to see how that directly impacts the water quality inside, particularly the northern end of the bay, where we're seeing much higher levels of nitrogen and much level, lower levels of dissolved oxygen. And when I think about dissolved oxygen, I really think about low dissolved oxygen like we're seeing in the Northern Bay as habitat loss. Um, once dissolved oxygen levels drop below four um, milligrams per liter, you start to have an anoxic zone or a, low, or a hypoxic zone that's transitioning to an anoxic zone. And most organisms cannot live in that zone so it essentially becomes a desert. Anything that's mobile that can move will start to move outside of that low dissolved oxygen area. And the same thing occurs in Buttonwood Brook. We have low dissolved oxygen areas, areas with high concentrations of pollution. Organisms try to adapt by moving to other areas that are not as polluted or degraded, uh, but then they concentrate into those areas. Uh, they compete more fiercely for food resources and they're also more concentrated and susceptible to predation from predators that come into the bay or in the brook. Uh, so that starts a cascade down the, down the, the ecology of the brook and bay. Uh, so what are we going to do about all this stuff that occurred between 1950 and 1980 um, and that's currently affecting the health of Buttonwood Brook and upon Ponagansett Bay, which, you know, is another treasure equal to or greater than Buttonwood Brook that supplies an enormous resource for recreation, supports commercial and recreational fisheries, um, supports daily recreation for thousands of people in the summer. Um, what are we going to do to try and restore this? Um, and, you know, before I move on, you know, I mentioned in the beginning that, you know, one of the big takeaways for all of this data we're collecting is to establish a baseline. We want to know now what is the state of the brook and bay ecosystem, which is really important as we go forward that we have a baseline that we can monitor progress, monitor effectiveness, and then make adaptive change if what we're doing isn't working. Um, the second reason we're doing all that science is because it's going to guide our restoration efforts. You know, 
the water quality data that we're using, that we're collecting on the brook every day, the trends that we're seeing in nitrogen, bacteria, and phosphorus levels at all these different sites are guiding us into pollution hotspots. They're guiding us into subcatchments that drain to the brook that we know we need to address. Um, and then thirdly, the, the data is guiding is guiding us along and it's going to enable us to move to the next phase of the project which is full restoration and how do we do that and it's also going to enable us to establish what we call a TMDL in the environmental community or a total maximum daily load and one piece of that is understanding just how much can Buttonwood Brook and Ponagansett Bay take, right? In order to understand that, we take all of the data that we're seeing now in our baseline, and we compare it to the water quality in Ponagansett Bay, and then we do some modeling, land use modeling, pollutant load modeling, and we also model the hydrodynamics inside the bay itself. So Jim Churchill from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute is the hydrodynamic modeler that's working on this project right now. And he will model exactly how water comes in through its one opening at the Big Durham Bridge, enters the bay, and flushes throughout the entire bay. Um, he will model, based off of the collection sites that we have and the pollution levels at each one of those collection sites, how those nutrients, bacteria, and other pollutants are swishing around the bay. How are they moving around, being distributed, and then are they being flushed out through the one opening that the inner Aponagansett Bay has, or are they not? And if they're not, what is the maximum amount that we can actually put into that bay without having it continue to eutrophy or degrade? Um, that is really one of the biggest goals that this science is gonna drive through because establishing a total maximum daily load for a water body in Massachusetts is a really stringent, prolonged process where all of your science and data undergoes intense scrutiny to ensure that it's valid before the state of Massachusetts, the EPA, will tell you you can't build a house because we've reached our total maximum daily load of nitrogen, or tell you that you need to replace your septic system because it's not a nitrogen removing septic system. It's a classic Title V that's discharging nitrogen to the watershed. So these have big implications. The TMDL has big implications for everybody. Um, and I'm sure everybody's heard about the new Mass DEP regulations that are sort of giving municipalities a choice between developing a 20 year watershed plan or you know, what is clearly just a stick of upgrade all your septic systems in five years, which is you know impractical, financially impossible, but being used, I believe, as a forcing function so that towns can really take a holistic look at their watersheds, use tools like total maximum daily loads and all the data we're collecting to develop a 20-year plan to improve water quality. If we don't do these things, uh, we will have a lime green in or upon against a bay in five to ten years. And I mean, I, I say that just anecdotally, but I really believe that's true. That the, the ecosystem is really at a tipping point right now, um, and Buttonwood Brook is really at a tipping point right now, and I feel like developing these plans is really important, and that's part of what the science is all about. So what do we do to fix it? Um, you know, I like to use the acronym, you know, remediate, restore, protect, and connect, you know, which is four things the Buzzards Bay Coalition does across the Buzzards Bay watershed, all 228 square miles of it. Um, you know, we restore habitat and ecosystems that have, had, have been degraded. Um, we participate in remediating stormwater runoff and other direct pollutants to our waterways. Um, we protect land by either purchasing land or putting it into conservation restrictions. And then we connect communities with those newly acquired public 
publicly accessible lands so that they can reconnect with their watershed. You know, there's, everyone remembers the old uh, hydrological cycle uh, figures that you used to see in textbooks with mountains and clouds and rain and it comes down in a circle. You know, and if you think back about those old images from your textbooks, the only thing missing from those is us. Yet society has probably been the biggest influence on that cycle um, in the last 50 to 100 years. So I believe reconnecting people with their watersheds, with their water. Buttonwood Brook right now is an invisible resource. It goes underneath Culverts, underneath Sharp and Allen Street, goes underneath Milton Street. It's an afterthought as you drive by that little green sign. And all those pocket forests in between each one of those main streets is invisible. It's inaccessible to you. Even if it's town land or in conservation, it's very difficult to get in there. It's mucky, it's full of prickle bushes, um, as Vic and I well know. <laughs> Um, you know, opening that land up, putting that land into conservation is a crucial part of reconnecting all of you with that brook. Um, and, you know, I'm a big fan of Yvonne Chouinard from Patagonia, and, you know, he has a great quote that you only protect what you love. Um, if you're not connected with this watershed, if you're not connected and appreciating all the things it does for us on a daily basis, then you just won't have the desire or the energy to, to protect it. Um, so, you know, as we look at this, what are the nuts and bolts of, of making change? Um, number one, green infrastructure and nature-based solutions offer a great way to sort of restore the natural hydrology in this watershed. Where we've put massive amounts of pavement and impervious surface, we can use rain gardens and infiltration basins and tree filters and a whole variety of other constructed wetlands to try to take some of that water, prevent it from running down the big long hill at Sharp Street, right into Buttonwood Brook, and put it back into the ground. Um, and that's really also a great hedge against droughts like we saw this last summer. You know, brooks that are fed by groundwater are much, like, much less likely to dry up. Um, this summer I went out on Buttonwood Brook um, and it was a hiking trail. It was bone dry. You could just walk on right in the brook bed all the way down to Dodge Reserve and you barely started getting a little bit of trickle south of Dodge Reserve off Russell's Mills Road. So it's, it's an amazing hedge um, for climate change as well. Um, habitat restoration, um, restoring functioning floodplain and riparian buffer that's been degraded along Buttonwood Brook where there are opportunities to do so can provide enormous pollution removal up and down the brook. And I'll, I'll use this as an example. Without throwing the zoo under the bus, I'll say that there's a lot of pollution coming out of the south side of the zoo. Um, but when you went one testing station south, which is at Sharp Street, um, there was a 90% reduction of bacteria in 0.8 miles of intact floodplain in pocket forest. Uh, bacterial levels were reduced by 90%, uh, which just points to how critical the last remaining pocket forests are up and down Buttonwood Brook. And if you look at Google Earth and you zoom back, you'll really just notice that the brook is really the last remaining green corridor connecting the north end of New Bedford down to Paydarum Harbor. Um, there's, everything else is essentially uh, covered in urbanization or suburban sprawl. Um, so preserving these remaining pocket forests, putting them into conservation, um, and ensuring they can just do their job um, in, without asking for anything. They're just out there working 24-7. Um, and then really just thinking about water as a resource instead of a waste product. You know, that paradigm that built up through the 50s, through the 80s, really just, like I said, disconnected people from their water, but it also treated water that was falling from the sky as a waste product to just be discarded as rapidly as possible. Just get it away from me. Um, 
verse what it was in the 1940s and before where we had wetlands and slow water moving through. And I'm not sure if anyone's heard of the slow water movement, but you know, there's a lot of places around the world where they're reintroducing wetlands that are able to handle huge storm events. I mean, this is critical for climate adaptation where we are seeing less frequent but much more intense storm events. And you know, when I walked Buttonwood Brook, um, I was, people were coming out of their houses at various places along the brook to tell me about how their yard floods or how this section of street floods along Birchwood Terrace or down along Sharp Street or in the Bliss Corner area of Buttonwood Brook um, because a lot of these areas are, have confined the brook into a space that's not much wider than this podium. Um, and it's trying to carry enormous amounts of water. So, you know, to do that, it keeps digging itself deeper down into the ground, and then it separates from its floodplain. But that, that's that reinforcing feedback loop I was telling you about. Now when the water goes through that section of brook, it, it rips through there at high velocity, which then it erodes the brook channels and churns up more sediment, undercutting brook banks, carrying it even faster down to a Ponagansett Bay. Um, and that's the feedback loop that we need to try to break. Um, and green infrastructure, nature-based solutions, habitat restoration, and reconnecting all of you with this amazing ecosystem that's out there. Um, I'm getting the shepherd's crook call from back there. <laughs> reconnecting all of you with, with that ecosystem is, is absolutely critical. Uh, so I want to just end with, um, you know, what can you do? You know, because I feel like there's a lot of people out there who are either unaware of the problem or they're aware of the problem but don't know how to act. You know, it's, it's difficult. I mean, I, I've suffered from it myself in my lifetime um, where you, you just know this problem exists and you're just like, what do I do? You know, climate change is a problem like that. It's, it can be paralytic. Um, so, you know, you can join organizations like the Buzzards Bay Coalition. You can donate to organizations like the Buzzards Bay Coalition or others like DNRT and the Waterkeeper Alliance. And there's a lot of them out there. They're doing great work. Um, but Buzzards Bay Coalition, you know, I work just over the hill. It's a New Bedford-based organization and it's heavily vested in environmental justice for New Bedford residents. Um, you can volunteer. We have Bay Watchers that are out doing water sampling. Um, you can come out on brook cleanups, which, by the way, we're going to have this Saturday up at the backside of St. Mary's Cemetery, connecting up to the Hidden Brook Apartments, which aptly named was built on top of a 40-acre wetland <laughs> that fed Buttonwood Brook. Um, and you can advocate, which I feel like right now in this project, as we move from data collection and understanding the baseline conditions we have in the brook, we're moving closer and closer to starting to implement projects. We just purpose, purchased the property in Cape Narrow and we're gonna try to remove an old dam that's behind that property. Um, that is gonna require support from local government, um, whether it be the mayor's office, the city council, the Dartmouth Select Board, the Dartmouth Town Administrator. You, you guys are who they listen to. Um, and you know, I'll be briefing the Harbor Planning and Implementation Committee, which Brian O'Hare is a member, um, and then the Dartmouth Select Board. I would love to have some of you in the back of the room when I brief the Dartmouth Select Board who at the end of that can raise their hands and go, this matters to me, um, because that's the only thing they listen to. You know, nonprofits don't make this kind of change. Governments don't make this kind of change. Communities make this change. That's how change happens. Um, so I'll leave you with a quick quote from Margaret Mead, my favorite quote, which is, never doubt that a small group of concerned and committed citizens can change the world, because indeed it is the only thing that ever has. Thanks. Oh, yeah.
Thank you, Dan. That was a fascinating talk. And I'm going to invite you back here because I know there are going to be questions from the audience. Uh, you, you've told us what the issues are with uh, the, the, the brook, and you've also told us what we can do to help today, and actually you told us what we can do on Saturday. So I hope to see lots of people there at the cleanup, and if there are questions from the audience, I'm sure Dan will be happy to answer them. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. yes. So we, we have a question about um, land being donated for uh, conservation from a private donor, which is, it's a huge part of our watershed protection program. We get land donated. We just had 60 acres on Cuddy Hunk donated um, that's going into conservation. Um, and what happens to that land? How, how is it used? Um, I'll say that sometimes, depending on the type of land, if it's wetland, deep in a forest and it's an isolated plot, sometimes the right thing to do with that is nothing. It's just sit on it and protect it. Our strategy is to look at that piece of land and then immediately start looking at concentric circles around it and look at every other piece of land we can acquire and connect into it because size matters. When you put land into conservation, um, it's great if a small piece of land, a couple of acres, makes a difference. This is a, you know, you've got to remember this problem scaled up over 30 years and started destroying our watersheds. So every little piece that we can put back into scaling it backwards matters. But as we look to really having an impact on water quality, that we can dip a bottle and measure, we look to aggregate more and more land. I'm hopeful that the land that you're, you, you donated to the town was adjacent to or adjoined to maybe additional conservation land or, or municipal land that's in conservation. Um, you know, and as I look at the map for Buttonwood Brook, there are plots of property on the parcel map that are sitting in the middle of wetlands that you will never be able to build on. I don't, I don't know, maybe these people are hedging on climate change that the whole place is going to dry out and they're not going to be wetlands in 100 years. But those plots of lands, by and large, should just be either donated to the town or put into conservation. So I can sort of see in the little world growing up where all the wetlands are, but how does the town organize, take care of these things? We're, we're wealthy here. So there are a lot of people who donate and um, can give money for restoration. Right. But this is where the watershed plan comes in that I discussed earlier. Uh, that mass DEP regulation is currently in effect on the Cape, but it's coming to Southeast Mass really soon, probably in the next five years. So if you live out, you know, on Potomska Road or down by the Slocum River and you have a septic system, you really have a vested interest in making sure that Dartmouth has the staff, the capacity, the technical capacity, and the desire to produce that watershed plan because that is exactly where they will identify critical parcels that are contributing to the watershed that have high ecological value. And those should be priorities to be put into conservation and to be buffered. But you can't do that if you don't take a holistic look at your watershed and develop a plan. To me, that is much more favorable than telling you 
that you have to spend thirty thousand dollars to upgrade your septic system. Dan, um, yeah. you stand in front of the mic because the video. Uh, oh, back, no. back. the other front. Oh, the other. Front. <laughs> Did that answer your question, Bill? Oh, yes. I mean, so that's where we go now. I got one. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah.
help mitigate that. Uh, but in general, you know, when you restore habitat and you slow water down, you give that water a chance to sink into the ground and recharge groundwater supplies. Uh, and you slow it down enough for all of these different native plants. I mean, even invasive plants remove nutrients. So, I mean, I'd rather have invasive plants there than nothing. Uh, you know, so when you do that, you allow nature to do what it does naturally. You know, plants love nitrogen. But if the nitrogen is going by at three meters per second, uh, they don't have time to grab it. So slowing that water down is critical. Um, and a lot of ways of, of slowing that water down is reintroducing natural habitat features to highly modified stretches of brook. We're talking about logs across the stream, reintroducing rocky stretches, ripples, pools, sinuous bends. These are natural brook features that in a lot of areas have just been scooped out and lost because because the brook has been squeezed in to a narrow straight channel. So that would be part of our restoration efforts. So we have a yes. question over here. Hi. Uh, what, what kind of sensors are you using, such as Arduino? And do you know if you have an API or a way in which the uh, public can access all the data so they can do things like in public schools? Yeah, so the question is, what kind of sensors are we using? And is, is the data access accessible? So right now, the, the sensors we're using are made by Onset Corp, right out of Bourne in Massachusetts, just over the bridge, and by YSI, Xylem, which is a, a company based on the West Coast. So these sensors are not uh, Wi-Fi. They, they don't connect out, so you have to manually haul these things up and download the data from them. Um, and you know, right now, when you download the data, you also have to calibrate it. So, you know, when I put a sensor in the water that's measuring conductivity, when I first put it in the water, I'm also taking a backup measurement with a calibrated probe. That probe tells me what the conductivity is when I put it in the water. And then I do that again when I, when I pull it out, and we calibrate that month of measurements using that front and back end. And then we have to QA, QC all the data, which, like I said, every 15 minutes for 30 days, you start accumulating a huge amount of data points. Um, and these sensors don't work perfectly. Uh, they drop measurements, they take erroneous measurements. So we go through in QC and basically what they call clean up the data. Um, and then that data eventually makes its way onto the Buses Bay Coalition website as sort of finished water quality data. Um, but if anyone has a scientific background, um, you know, we, we do love getting volunteers out there who can help with some of this field data work, with field collection, with maintenance of sensors because they do foul very quickly. So, you know, uh, in addition to being the project manager, I'm also the chief sensor maintenance guy, the water sampler, and the guy who takes out the trash at the end of the day. So, if anyone uh, has an inclination to volunteer to help out with some of this work, I'm, I'm, I'd love to take your number. <laughs> so, we have a question from the back, they can't quite shout it. Yep. So, they want to know what's the impact of Buttonwood Park on the brook? What is the impact of Buttonwood Park on the brook? And that's a great question. You know, just north of Buttonwood Park is the Kenton Corridor, you know, the most highly urbanized corridor in New Bedford. It's over a million square feet of impervious pavement, and every inch of it drains straight into Buttonwood Brook, right at Kenton Street. I mean, that is a massive volume, and it's probably more than it needs to be, because if you drive through there, you can see that the median's paved. There's all kinds of parking lots that you know have paved aprons that could be green. Um, that dumps an enormous amount of pollution into the top end of Buttonwood Park, where the brook comes under Route 140, under Kempton Street, and enters the park. Uh, amazingly enough, you know there there was a lot of anecdotal talk and mythology amongst the, the people who care about this. And some of this was driven by previous studies that, you know, all the problems are in New Bedford. Boy, if they would just fix Buttonwood Pond, you know, we could, we could have a clean bay. Um, and I think this initial round of data that we collected really just blew those myths out of the water. Um, what we saw in the data was that we were having 
high nitrogen, high bacteria, huge amounts of phosphorus entering the system at BWV2, which is our test site, right there at the little walking bridge at the north end of Buttonwood Park. And by the time we tested immediately south of the pond where it goes underneath Fuller Parkway, those levels had dropped to almost nothing. So right now, Buttonwood Pond is acting like a giant piece of green infrastructure. Um, but it's under duress. It is, it is really under intense pressure. And anyone who drove by Buttonwood Pond this summer could see how quickly the pond dried out and how shallow Buttonwood Pond has become as a result of those high velocity water inputs from that big impervious area in points north depositing all that sediment into the pond. So the pond is on borrowed time. It is only going to do its thing for so long before it just keels over and collapses. And we are putting immense pressure on it right now. So the park, the pond, is having an enormous positive effect. The zoo, unfortunately, just south of that, is having a, a slight negative effect. But thankfully, like I said, those pocket forests to the south are managing that for us right now. Uh, until some developer gets his eye on it and then fills that wetland and builds on it. So critical to get those protected. Okay. So, Anne. Yes. Where's the dam you want to take down? How many other dams are there? And did the Buttonwood Pond Dam get any support? Yeah, so the question is, you know, where, where are the dams that Buzzards Bay Coalition is looking at removing, you know? Um, and was there ever a migratory fish run on Buttonwood Brook? So in the course, we just recently purchased the property at 705 Elm Street in Dartmouth, um, and we've received some additional grant money that's gonna allow us to, what I call, rewild that property. It's a one and a half acre property that sits right next to DNRT Strongman Reserve, and our intent is to remove the dam on the property, tear down the house on the property, remove all underground infrastructure on the property, and then return it to its pre-development condition and restore the floodplain that was filled in partially to put the house where it never should have been. So we are sort of taking this parent, the new paradigm of, you know, how do we publicly and intrinsically value nature over everything else? And that Elm Street property is sort of front and center. There's a dam back behind that house um, and then there's another dam on Dodge Reserve that we would also like to see removed. Those two dams are the southernmost dams on Buttonwood Brook, and the, the dam behind the 705 Elm Street property is the head of tide dam for Ponagansett Bay. So it is just receiving tidal influence on the highest tides and somewhat disrupted by the Elm Street culverts, which are actually up off the water, very poorly designed. Um, those block migratory fish passage, um, but they're also trapping sediments behind them, and they're also disconnecting the aquatic ecosystem. They form as segmenting out the aquatic ecosystem. They prevent what we know is in there now, American eels, from being able to freely move up and down the water, but they're also preventing migratory fish like smelt or river herring from coming back um, and in the course of looking at that property, there's a historic mill on the 705 Elm property called the Wadey Mill. It was built in 1735. Um, we want to absolutely preserve those ruins and incorporate them as a part of that rewilded property. And I was just meeting with the Dartmouth Historic Commission last night about this, and they're being super helpful about digging up information on that uh, and ensuring that our design for rewilding takes that mill into account. Um, but, you know, that segmenting of, of aquatic ecosystems, uh, the trapping of sediments, also blocks gravel, logs, other things that would naturally come down from above the dams and form that complex habitat that I talked about earlier. So when you look at it, and I've walked that stretch below the dam, it's really just bare rock. There's, there's nothing there habitat-wise and the whole floodplain is covered in invasive species. So the dam at Dodge Reserve and the dam at 705 Elm Street are really a priority for us to get removed because they are the southernmost dams 
they will affect migratory fish passage, and they do affect water quality. Well, I'm, I'm going to leave the last formal question to Anne, the founder of Science Cafe New Bedford. Well, we want to take one from uh, Vic, because he's got a I'm sure Dan will be free to answer any other questions people may have. Oh. Well, I'll let this gentleman here, because he hasn't asked one yet. And he walked half the brook with me. And <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, with respect to uh, New Bedford being a cause of water pollution, there are, there's a main channel and then there are the two big tributaries coming from Allen Street and from uh, above this corner, which is Paul Dark. Right. Which, can you tell from what you've already got how they compare the main channel and the two tributaries? So the, the question is, you know, what I alluded to earlier with the old myth and the anecdote that New Bedford is the, all the problem with this brook and all the problem to the Pond Banks of Bay. Um, how do the Dartmouth side and the two tributaries that originate in Dartmouth contribute? So, you know, one of the key takeaways for us from all the data that we collected initially is that the pollution is widely distributed up and down the brook. Um, what we see is nutrients pulsing in above Buttonwood Park, being attenuated by Buttonwood Pond, some reintroduction from Buttonwood Zoo, and then at Allen Street, Sharp Street, Milton Street, all along the brook where you have east-west cross streets that all slope down from both sides, but the brook is low ground, you see nutrients pulsing back in and all those stormwater outfalls that are up and down the entire brook. Remember, 60 stormwater outfalls distributed along this nine mile brook. That's, that's you know, just about every 450 yards. If you were to walk, there'd be another pipe dumping stormwater in. So what we found is that that nutrient load pulses in, bacterial loads pulsing in from much of the same spots because they kind of go hand in hand. And we saw larger spikes coming in from the Bliss Corner tributary and the George's Farm tributary. So uh, George's Farm being the, the bigger of the two, but we were seeing bacterial spikes in you know the 20,000 colony forming units per 100 mLs coming out of those tributaries. And just for reference, they closed beaches at 200 colony forming units. So we're seeing 20,000 coming out of those tribs um, and then going down into a pond in Gansett Bay, and we're seeing nitrogen levels that are three to four times what you would like to see in even an urban stream coming out of those two tributaries. So um, all the impervious surface on the Bliss Corner tributary, and then probably the agricultural area that George's Farm is, which is, you know, from a, from a, uh, you know, a management perspective, a water quality management perspective, we would like to work with George's Farm to adjust some really basic practices. Simple things like tilling direction and a riparian buffer would probably solve 90% of the problem for them. And I think we can connect them with the funding sources that will help them do that for free. Um, and then on, on the Bliss Corner side, um, you know, there's a lot of green infrastructure and nature-based solutions work to be done. And then if you're familiar with the Potter Center Street neighborhood that cuts across. The brook is entirely underground there. This is another place where they built a neighborhood directly on top of the brook and just put it in a 36 inch pipe and then drained all their stormwater to it. So it exits out on, at Arnold Street, kind of on almost on the border of Dodge Reserve um, into a beautiful wetland that's owned by the town of Dartmouth. Um, but unfortunately, because of the velocity that that water comes out of that stormwater pipe, it rips straight through the wetland rather than going out and slowly traveling through it, which would probably remove almost all of that bacteria if that were the case. So again, a target for restoration that would just let nature do its job and the water coming out into Dodge Reserve in the main channel would probably be completely within normal limits. So, um, I, I, I'll just... I know Dan will be around to answer a few more questions, but I'll go I, as long as you want. <laughs> I I want to thank Dan again for tonight's presentation.
I'd also like to th thank the, the last round for hosting Science Cafe yeah, yeah, yeah. Tuesday of this month. So just before we wind up, a couple of, of items. Uh, Dan mentioned that this Saturday there'll be a, a trash cleanup of Buttonwood Brook. This is going to start at 11 a.m. and run to 2 p.m. on Saturday. If you're interested in being a part of this, uh, people will meet in the northeast corner of St. Mary Cemetery, which is right across from the Shores supermarket on Route 6. So I hope to see people there this weekend. Next month, we will have a, a talk from uh, one of the Science Cafe uh, steering committee members, um, biologist Nicole Danaha Garcia, and she's going to talk to us about the research she's been doing in the Bahamas, where she's studying a, a population of dolphins who make peace, not war, when they meet strangers. So I look forward to that on February the 7th, the Tuesday in February. So thank you again, everyone, for being here this evening. Dan's going to be around for more questions. Oh, when is the select board meeting? It's going to be in March. It's sometime in March. Um, I'll put on a flyer. Just like that, I did Dan will put on a flyer and let <laughs> everyone know when that is. So yeah, anyone who wants to turn up would be fantastic. So thank you again, everyone.